Perfect. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the House Standing Committee on Finance. Thank you for the opportunity to present today on behalf of Canadian job and wealth creators from across the country. My name is Benjamin Bergen. I'm President of the Council of Canadian Innovators, or CCI. I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleague Nick Chavo, Director of Federal Affairs. CCI represents over 150 of Canada's fastest growing technology intensive companies. All of our members are proudly headquartered in Canada, employing thousands of workers across the country. These companies are leaders in sectors critical to our economic future, like AI, cybersecurity, fintech, health technologies, clean tech, and more. They are innovating right here at home while commercializing their solutions globally, selling to governments and consumers across Europe, Asia, and of course, the United States. As we approach budget 2025, it's important to recognize that Canada is at a crossroads. We are experiencing what many are calling the great Canadian slump with rising living costs, stagnant productivity, and a declining GDP per capita. This reality is making it harder for Canadians to maintain their standard of living. The facts are striking. Real medium wages have barely grown since the 1970s, and Canada's productivity has dropped to less than 1% since the year 2000. Forecasts now suggest Canada could be the worst performing economy in the OECD in the near future. These challenges are compounded by structural issues like climate change, global conflicts, and pressure on our healthcare system. But I'm not here to complain, and our members are not passive bystanders to these challenges. CCI's members have been actively working on policy solutions, and we believe with the right strategic actions, Canada can turn the tide. One of the most important areas for reform is Canada's approach to working with homegrown companies and ensuring Canada remains home to the very organizations that will fuel the country's long-term prosperity. At the heart of our recommendations is that we need a modern industrial strategy, one that places innovation, productivity, and the intangible assets at the core of our economic framework. This must include reforming key programs like the Scientific Research and Experimental Development Tax Credit, or SHRED. Currently, the program is outdated, and its complexity hinders domestic companies from being able to fully benefit from it. In fact, a significant portion of SHRED funding goes to foreign firms. We believe this must change to better support Canada's innovators. Our budget submission recommends cost-neutral ways to improve this critical program, and I'd be happy to explore this issue further during our Q&A. Additionally, reforming government procurement is essential. Government procurement spending represents a significant portion of our GDP, yet our uh, procurement systems are often lacking risk-averse and are ri rigid and lacking the flexibility to adapt to new innovative solutions. This not only stifles Canadian companies, but it also prevents governments from accessing cutting-edge technologies that could improve the public service. The changes won't happen overnight, but tackling these procurement barriers is vital for unlocking Canada's innovation potential. I'm also happy to expand on this topic if it's of interest to the committee and speak to our recent reports, building winners and buying ideas. We also need to avoid policies and inadequately punish innovators and entrepreneurs. The recent changes to the capital gain tax, for example, are counterproductive at a time when we need to be fostering growth and investment. These policies create an added burden on entrepreneurs making it harder for Canadian companies to scale and compete globally. When Canada's productivity is in crisis, we cannot afford to hold back our most innovative companies and their leaders. In closing, I want to address something I heard from Minister Champagne today at the Indu Committee, which I saw a reporter from The Logic tweet out. The minister suggested the challenges facing Canada's economy are due to a lack of ambition from our innovators and business leaders. If only innovators would seize the moment, we'd be better off, the minister stated. Frankly, this view is troubling, and it ignores the realities that entrepreneurs growing businesses in Canada are living through. For nearly a decade, we've been telling the government that Canadians are innovative, ambitious, and relentless in their businesses as anywhere else in the world. The real issue is that our government isn't providing the modern policy frameworks needed for them to succeed. They're still using old playbooks, Meanwhile, superpowers like the US, Europe, and Asia are using new strategies to reflect the digital economy their companies are operating in. I get it. It's easier for government to blame innovators instead of tackling the responsibility for the role they should be playing to create the marketplace frameworks for innovative Canadian companies to succeed. But it's like a hockey coach blaming the players for not skating fast enough 
when there's no ice on the rink. The problem isn't Canadian ambition. It's our policies, strategies, and institutions that aren't harnessing and supporting innovators. That's why Budget 2025 represents a crucial opportunity to enact bold reforms, reforms that will foster innovation, increase productivity, and drive long-term economic growth. I look forward to answering any questions and further discussing how we can build an economy that Canadians deserve, one that is prosperous, innovative, globally competitive for years to come. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bergen. And uh, just uh, to members again, we do have Raven. In um, my next questions are for the Council of Canadian Innovators. Uh, you had commissioned a survey of entrepreneurs in July, which showed 90% of respondents believe the Liberals' capital gains tax hike would have a negative effect on the innovation economy, and yet uh, Liberal Budget 2024 stated, quote, increasing the capital gains inclusion rate is not expected to hurt Canadian business competitiveness, unquote. Do you believe the Liberal government's assessment on that to be accurate? Uh, no, I do, not, I do not believe so. I think it's uh, unequivocally false. Thank you. Also in this survey that you did, uh, it listed 67% of tech entrepreneurs uh, that responded from your survey um, has said that access to capital is their top challenge in business. Do you think these liberal capital gains tax increases will hurt the ability of Canadian workers and businesses in the tech sector to stay in Canada? So not a question of if, um, but it already is uh, impacting it. And so a lot of the information uh, that we've been receiving, um, you know, initially when it was announced was uh, uncertainty, uh, obviously, because the measures themselves hadn't been fully um, baked, um, and then a continued delay of it. And so what we have heard, uh, not only from our member companies, but broader uh, folks in the ecosystem is that it's impacting their ability to go and raise capital, right, because it's less attractive here in Canada, where you can do it south of the border. Uh, it's making it more difficult to keep highly skilled workers uh, here because um, their uh, potential stock options are at a higher rate. Um, and then ultimately the returns are lower. And so it's sort of a, a, a perfect combo where you're seeing it impact um, founders, uh, employees, and, uh, and investors. I mentioned in your opening statement the issue of government procurement, and so I wanted to ask you on that. There was a, a, a report that um, that was written in April of 2024 um, by your organization that had to do with historic innovation underperformance, and um, we, we've seen under this Liberal government uh, IT procurement policies and actually management that has led to arrive can style results um, favoring uh, well-connected friends and wasting taxpayer dollars not following government processes and so with 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 that have you have you seen how this might damage our innovation economy and reputation of Canada's tech sector with the way that uh, that the government is currently managing their procurement system yeah, so I think there's a couple pieces uh, in that, and you know, great question. I think arrive can is actually a symptom of a of a process that's broken, right? If we actually had a transparent, clear mechanism for domestic firms to be able to procure, uh, we wouldn't have seen something like arrive can happen. And you know, it was during sort of the darkest days of COVID, and you know, those exceptions on those pieces you can consider. But if we had a straightforward process, we would see firms actually be able to access and, and, and properly go through it. So the complexity of it is definitely part of the issue in terms of why we've arrived at RiveCan. So I don't want anyone in this committee thinking that procuring domestic leads to RiveCan. That is not the conclusion that should be reached. So that's step one. Step two is because the procurement system is so complex and challenging, you often don't even get domestic firms even applying because they know that the way that the RFPs are written, they know that the way that certain structures are set up, there's no way for them to actually win contracts. And so a lot of the member companies that we work with could sell to the Canadian government, but A, it's so delayed and time consuming that they actually go and try and sell to other governments. And the reality often is that you go and become successful elsewhere before our own governments will actually purchase your product. So that's sort of the headwinds that we're facing. The Canadian Council of uh, Innovators, uh, Mr. Bergen, uh, you referenced uh, a couple things I'd like to expand a little more. Um, what are your, you mentioned some, some challenges with shred. Can you elaborate briefly? 
Yeah, for sure. So for those not familiar, you know, Shred's a $4 billion uh, a year expenditure for the government. It's actually our largest um, expenditure in terms of innovation. Uh, about 18,000 companies uh, receive it. Um, uh, but uh, when you sort of dig into it, uh, sort of a handful of companies receive, you know, close to 25% of every Shred dollar. Uh, and it turns out that a good chunk of those are actually foreign multinationals. So in a space like the innovation economy, where unemployment is effectively zero, <clears throat> we're subsidizing the R&D of foreign multinationals while making it more challenging for our own domestic firms to be able to hire and create opportunity uh, for their firms. Now, this has consequences where you're no longer creating IP rich companies, which is where wealth and prosperity has really moved to. And you're supporting um, uh, firms that ultimately are taking the wealth out of the country. And to sort of indicate um, how sort of systemic this is, you know, up until 2021, Huawei was still receiving a considerable amount of money from this program, indicating that, you know, we're funding not only the R&D of, of foreign firms, but also foreign firms that we've actually deemed to be uh, a national security risk and which we view to be, um, you know, confrontational to, uh, to us as a nation. Sorry, I just have to confirm. Are you, are you suggesting that Huawei was still receiving rebates under the SHRED program? Correct. Wow. Um, isn't it also true that about 30% of the program is spent on a cottage industry of consultants that help people with the paperwork to fill out these applications? Yeah, so I think there's like two pieces here, right? One is where is the money going? Is it actually leading to outcomes that are leading to wealth and prosperity? You know, listening around the room, it, it really sounds like we have a revenue uh, challenge in this country, right? We can't pay for housing. We can't pay for arts and culture, right? And so by creating opportunities where we're able to drive and support domestic firms uh, in programs like Shred and making sure that those dollars are being allocated to the right outcomes, that's, that's kind of one step. So definitely looking at it from that framework. The other is also the cost, right? Shred hasn't really been updated, um, you know, in more than 40 years. And so we have a program uh, that basically companies have to contort themselves in, in order to be able to access uh, the funding. And so it requires, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a, you know, a gambit of different types of consultants and agents. And so a, an entire shred cottage industry, you know, has built up in many practices. Now, look, programs do need overhead and do need to cost things. But when it's close to 25 to 30 percent going towards uh, consultancies rather than driving outcomes, we've got a real a real challenge here, a real issue. Okay. And if I can just add on that quickly, you know, this is not something new. Um, here at CCI, we've been calling for reform to this program for almost a decade. Uh, we secured a win in budget 2023 to, you know, uh, have some kind of consultation. That consultation process has now happened twice. Uh, in both cases, uh, you know, we've participated. But, um, you know, speaking on behalf of, of our members in the industry, I would say if we don't see concrete reforms to update the program for the 21st century in the fall economic statement, I think many of us would consider that a failure. So uh, we do hope for the best. Um, on, on capital gains tax, just so I'm clear, the feedback from your members is it will create incentives for them to look south of the border. Is that your testimony? Yes. Yeah. Unequivocally. And I was also at Indu committee this morning. Um, in my free time, I like to travel around and watch other committees. Um, I heard the same quote. Um, how does it make you feel when you hear a minister, um, say what he did? And then also when you look at like the shred you just mentioned or the amount of money that we subsidize to foreign multinationals um, in electric vehicle battery sector, but then they're putting taxes higher on Canadian companies that are based here trying to grow them. Yeah, so, you know, I'll, I'll remove feelings uh, on this one. And I think we just need to sort of look at, at sort of the reality. And to quote William Blake, uh, execution is the chariot of genius. And what we've seen from this government over the last 10 years is an inability to execute. Uh, looking at various programs, whether it be things like super clusters, which were downgraded to clusters, whether it looks to you know, the creation of the Canadian Innovation Corporation, the economic tables. I mean, this is really um, a, a government that has truly struggled to understand where the 21st century economy is going. And I think sort of the last remarks of a minister to blame innovators for their inability to deliver is an indication that the government has lost the plot. 
um, and truly indicates uh, real challenges going forward in terms of how are we actually going to get ourselves out of these challenges economically so that we can pay for housing, so that we can pay for transit, so we can pay for healthcare, so we can pay for arts and culture. And so, you know, I would turn it back really on the minister to say, show us what you've accomplished, show us what you've done. Uh, and, you know, then we can talk about, you know, who's, uh, who's got ambition and who's able to actually deliver. Thank you very much. The first thing I wouldn't mind asking about is your procurement. Um, part of the reason our, our procurement and really, uh, I almost want to blow the whole sort of system up, is because we also have very much, not only do we have excellent innovators, but I also think we have a small business economy. Uh, and so I would like both our innovators and our small business economy to be able to tap into our procurement. The thing is, it seems like such a big beast. And if I had to ask you, how do we get started uh, in terms of the first step or two, what would be your recommendation? Um, thank you for your question. And, you know, look, uh, if, you know, our comments are viewed as, you know, spicy or fiery, I think it just is an indication of where we are as a country, right? If our economy had grown over the last decade to similar like places like Denmark or the United States or Australia, there'd be an additional $500 billion in our economy each year, more than enough to pay for probably the housing requests that we've seen put forward at this committee or the arts and culture um, or, you know, potentially a basic income. So, Getting innovation right, getting the 21st century economy right is critical. We have a revenue problem in this country, and the people that we work with are revenue generators. So figuring out ways to support them is critical. And so, you know, I know the minister uh, does support innovators in terms of his language, but when he goes to committee, it is truly troubling um, that that's his framing. Now, on the procurement piece, I will uh, kick it over to uh, Nicholas to uh, to tackle that because there is real opportunity here for the government to do something transformative. It's going to take time, but there's an opportunity. Thanks, Benjamin. Yeah, so thank you for that question, uh, MP Jurowitz. And I, I think if I could offer the committee maybe one top-line concrete recommendation to start to move the logjam, uh, it would be to create a dedicated fund for technology procurement that departments could use when they need quick, innovative solutions. And so the idea behind this fund would be to reduce risk aversion, uh, support ongoing product development with firms, uh, with suppliers, and focus on key areas that are strategic, both for Canadians and for the government. So think energy, healthcare, uh, clean tech, cybersecurity. Um, ideally, this, this fund, which can be modeled after international examples like the SBIR, um, would have a simple, fast application process. It would be focused on collaboration. It would build capacity within the public service. Um, and it would also offer financial incentives for departments to, to take risks. But if I can take a step back, I would say I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding of what procurement is or should be in the federal government. And this is shared across governments of all stripes going back decades. Procurement is not a silo just to get things. It is 15% of our GDP. Um, and so every single year, the federal government, governments across the country are spending billions of taxpayer dollars on everything from pencils to software to fighter jets, but we are not doing it in a way that is strategic. Other advanced economies understand that they can use procurement not only to deliver services for their citizens, but also to grow their economy and to play to those domestic firms where there are strengths. So I do think it is a, it is a bit of a cultural shift in terms of procurement in this country and Simply put, procurement done well is prosperity for Canadians. So uh, I do hope we can see some of that. To the Council of Innovators, uh, do we need investment in Canada in machinery, equipment, IT, uh, technology, physical infrastructure? What, what are some of the things that we need investment in to, uh, to reverse this productivity gap? Yeah, so in... Canada's tech sector, we really struggle to have the capital required uh, in order to help uh, companies scale and grow. And so you know, there's a few areas where this sort of plays out. You know, one is in sort of the, the VC space. You know, there's very few uh, VC firms that have uh, sort of capital uh, allocation to be able to help firms scale and grow. And so often firms have to go outside of, uh, outside of Canada in order to access funding. So we have um, some capital challenges uh, in the VC space that are an issue. 
in terms, though, of where, you know, government really should be focusing its energy is looking at, you know, what are the outcomes that are going to drive um, firms for being, you know, successful. And, you know, our mantra really at the council is the government shouldn't be, you know, picking winners, they should be supporting winners. And so when you look at different government programs and different funding opportunities, how are those funds being marshaled and allocated towards those firms that are showing, you know, green spurts and showing, you know, real opportunity? Often in Canada, uh, we support um, uh, uh, research, um, uh, but we, we forget about the development side of things. And it's the development side of things that fundamentally will pay for many of the things that folks in this room, you know, are talking about. So, you know, looking at uh, ways of alleviating that and creating opportunity is critical. Um, and we point to, you know, Shred really just being one of many programs where the government could, could be, you know, allocating those dollars more effectively. Will increasing the inclusion rate on capital gains help draw investment into your sector? So in terms of, uh, you know, the analysis that's been done, not just by our organization, but by others, is that when you make it more uh, expensive and, and make it more costly um, and you drive down uh, risk versus reward, um, you see capital move elsewhere. And in the innovation economy, capital Thank you. and Thank actual you. labor... I, I have I have a lot of questions. I'm sorry, I really didn't yeah. mean to, to cut cut you short. Yeah. But but so no so correct to say that, or it is, it is your testimony that this will drive investment out of the innovation sector. Correct. Okay. And uh, what what are the other barriers to investment? Uh, uh, red tape, the the inability to to procure to access procurement contracts. What are some of the other barriers to uh, to investment and to opportunity in the innovation uh, community? Yeah, so definitely, um, you know, the red tape and, and challenges on that issue. In terms of uh, investment, though. Where we're seeing um, some more friction is, is you know, really getting cu uh, first customers, right? So, you know, you'll often struggle to have government actually purchase and buy domestic technology. They'll often fund them. They'll give them, you know, funding through different programs. And really what our uh, members are telling us is that, you know, they would much rather a purchase order rather than, you know, a grant or a subsidy because they can take that and they can go to a bank and get funded and, and increase, you know, their ability to, to, to fund their operations. So, you know, for us, it's a, it's a, it's a shift in some of how these policies are are structured, and through that, you'll be able to uh, help unlock uh, capital that is uh, that is very much needed. You, you rightly spoke of the uh, the declining per capita GDP that that is we've experienced in Canada over the last ten years. Uh, the worst performing economy projected, uh, worst performing economy in the OECD. Uh, you also said you you mentioned your opening remarks, and maybe I'm going to get uh, get to clear clarify the the point that you made about the stagnant stagnant product, uh, productivity since 2000. Um, if you could clarify on that remark, but also what are we going to need to to do something about this? We, we, we need to incentivize innovators and um, we're going to need tax uh, taxing these these innovators is not going to do it. Could you could you give us some thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I sadly don't have a short answer here, so I'll try and be as succinct as possible. But in essence, what we have to realize is that the economy has shifted, where wealth and prosperity is no longer actually captured in labor, it's no longer captured in jobs. It's in those who actually own ideas, so own intellectual property and own data. And the value chain system has shifted. And so in order for us to be able to build wealth and prosperity, to reverse the, the, um, the stagnation, we have to build an innovation economy that can capture value chains. And so we actually have to shift many things at once. It's not just one tax policy that's going to unbind everything. So what we have to look at is how do you build firms that are able to keep and retain intellectual property here? So when we're looking at how we fund things, are we generating IP? Are we retaining IP and then are we commercializing it? And if you marshal government uh, if, programs, just whether quickly, it, then I, yeah. I don't have much time left. Is, is, it, yeah. is it is it fair to say then that uh, there, there's an, an incredible deficit of investment uh, between Canada and the United States when you you look at the uh, cross border investment between Canada and the United States, which uh, for many many years was positive in Canada's favor? Canadians are now investing their money in the United States. It's the, the gap is five almost half a trillion dollars. Uh, is this failure or, or um, some of these failures that you've spoken of? They contribute to this uh, this this um, deficit in investment in Canada. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't have a framework that actually captures wealth, it will even go elsewhere, right? Like money is smart, it moves. 
I would also point out that 125,000 Canadians left Canada in uh, 2023, a record number, and a lot of those were in the tech sector. So not only are we seeing capital uh, flee and go south of the border, we're actually seeing a lot of our highly skilled workers as okay. well. So that's that's. I'm happy to kick things off. I mean, let me just first say, uh, Mr. Sorbar, thank you for the question, and we agree this is definitely uh, the greatest country in the world. I think, you know, we all want those programs you, you listed. I think how we, we pay for them is maybe where we disagree. But to your question on Shred, um, this is integral. As, as Benjamin said, this is the largest, this is the oldest, this is the most important innovation program we have in this country. It is nearly $4 billion every single year. And we are squandering a lot of that money, not only to foreign multinationals, but also to, you know, the big four consultants just to fill out the application. Um, so, so it is in desperate need of reform, and, and we've participated in those consultations. I'll also note, though, that when we developed our uh, policy brief, we did so in a thoughtful way to make it cost neutral. We know that, you know, uh, money is tight right now, so we wanted to be, uh, you know, thoughtful about that. That also requires that Canada implement a national innovation box or a patent box. So actually, also Nick, something I, we're happy to discuss. I, I want to jump in there before I run out of time because I was sure. actually, I wanted to ask about the National Innovation Box Bracket Patent Box Regime and your recommendation too on your brief. You know, would it be wise to say shift resources from one program into that box? Because I, I, for everything I've read, and I'm heavily read and, and, and so forth, and you have a lot of very thoughtful leaders within within the council, is, is a National Innovation Box something where the gains, the first derivative change in, change in gains that we would see on the innovation side and the productivity side, would that, would that be a key driving force for us? Yes. Uh, so the whole idea behind, you know, our vision with a, an innovation box or a patent box, you know, as you mentioned, is moving from inputs to outcomes. Um, and so for those on the committee who, you know, maybe not familiar, uh, it's really an income based incentive to encourage the commercialization of IP uh, in Canada rather than direct R&D spending. Uh, more than a dozen European Union countries have implemented some form of patent box along with China, Australia and the United Kingdom. And one of the reasons for that is that these tend to be more effective for small uh, open economies like Canada's uh, that rely on not only exports but global value chains. And so we are really trying to rebalance shred with this patent box and say that you know, if you want the benefits uh, in terms of, uh, you know, better tax treatment, you can have those, um, but you need to be commercializing that IP here in Canada and ensuring that the value of that and the wealth of that flows back to our economy and to Canadians themselves. Okay. Uh, my questions are going to be to the Council of Canadian Innovators. And uh, you, you talked about uh, how the government has been slow in adapting uh, new technology. You talked about how Minister Champagne has uh, started the blame game, blaming innovators. Um, do, do you feel like there, the things have been hostile towards innovation uh, by this Liberal government? So I think, you know, you have to look at, at the record there uh, specifically, right? So, uh, you know, I, I did bring up William Blake, you know, uh, cherry, or, uh, execution as the chariot of genius. And I think there's been some attempts at trying to do some things, but the delivery in terms of how they've actually been executed missed the mark. And you know, hostile, uh, you know, I would say maybe misunderstand or don't understand the complexities of an innovation economy. And the outcome of that is is apparent, right? We've seen policies that haven't haven't delivered. We haven't seen, you know, uh, the successes of, of job creation and wealth promotion from things like uh, the super clusters. And so rather than relying and engaging with uh, companies that are that are winners that are out there actually selling you know, products globally, uh, a lot of these policies are being ingested and created by um, folks who candidly don't understand how an innovation economy works. And so, you know, part of our work is to come in to educate and to engage. And, you know, we have uh, definitely tried to do that with Minister Champagne and, you know, his predecessor as well. But when you look at the frameworks of what's been uh, actually achieved, you know, I think that that record is definitely a failure. Uh, now, when you look at uh, national defense and the innovation that needs to take place there and what you see happening in Ukraine, and you know, Ukraine's been able to stay in the fight because of innovation using things like drones, electronic warfare and cyber uh, security uh, to fend off attacks from, from the Russians. How can the innovation sector help Canada? Uh, develop, develop the type of uh, defensive mechanisms that we need here, uh, including cybersecurity. Uh, and you look at um, AUKUS in Pillar 2, which is all about quantum computing, AI, and uh, cybersecurity, and Canada's not in the game. Uh, what, what can the innovation 
innovators across this country do to help us from a national security and defense standpoint. So on that front, I'll definitely kick it over to, to Nick in just a second, because I think yeah, you know, he's very well versed on, on many of these pieces. But the thing about strategic procurement is that not only will it actually lead to economic uh, opportunity and prosperity, but it's also part of national security. Uh, so to the point of your question around things like NATO, our inability to have the capacity to defend this country and to be able to work with our partners is critical. Um, and then, look, if we're going to meet our NATO commitments, right, which is sort of that 2% piece, do it by actually buying domestic innovation and technology that can then be sold and go global. You know, right now I'm working with a firm in particular that the Ukrainians desperately want their technology, um, and it's a Canadian technology, but there's no ability uh, for them to actually be able to procure it. And so when we think about these types of things, how are we, um, you know, effectively using uh, our expenditure on things like defense, not only to, to defend us, but create economic opportunity. Um, Nick, I'll pass it to you if we still have time. Mr. Bergen, can you just say what no. exactly that technology is that the Ukrainians need and, and uh, what's the impediments to getting it to them? Uh, so given, you know, the uh, NDAs that we have signed with our member companies, I'm not going to, you know, jump right into this right now in, in committee, but, um, you know, I'd be happy to speak to you offline uh, about this particular piece. Okay, the AUKUS piece and NATO piece to, to your colleague. Yeah, maybe just on the NATO piece, I'll say, look, we're trying to get to that 2% uh, target. Um, the only way we're going to be able to do that is is through procuring domestic capabilities. Um, we know that between 2018 and 2020, the cyber sector in Canada grew over 30%. Uh, in terms of employment, R&D, uh, and revenue, but only 8% of that came from Canadian government contracts. And to really put it in perspective, uh, Canada's Five Eyes partners buy three times as much Canadian cyber technology products and services than Ottawa itself. So other countries understand what we have. They are using it for their security apparatus. Uh, and for whatever reason, we, we fail to do so. I can't tell you how many times I have met with a new member, and they have told me that they do business with the American military, with the British military, uh, but DND is nowhere to be found. So uh, there's a lot of processes in there in order to, um, I think, um, you know, hold our own in our military alliances. Uh, Mr. Chevo, I, I think I agree with you if I understand your testimony correctly that Canada could be using and should be using our 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 procurement policy to help better support uh, the Canadian environment for for businesses. Um, I, I, I'm wondering uh, then, would you agree that? Uh, provisions in Canada's uh, trade agreements that prohibit Canada from distinguishing between uh, foreign bidders for procurement and Canadian domestic uh, bidders, uh, that those would be harmful then, such provisions? I would. I would. I think uh, the risk aversion we see across procurement also applies to some of our trade agreements. So we stick to them to a T, which is, of course, important for our allies, but, uh, but sometimes it comes at the cost of Canadian industry. And and I guess following that, it seems like the United States, they, they, they seem to be intermittently uh, uh, liberal in terms of trade policy, and then they get protectionists. Mm. And the latest iteration, I think, under the Biden administration, and I think even under the Trump administration, uh, were very avowedly protectionist. Mm. Um, do, you, do you see that as sort of a, giving us a little bit of political room as a country to be a little bit more uh, um, uh, uh, rugged, I guess, uh, in uh, in terms of our um, using our our procurement policies to help Canadian business people, I do. I, I think a lot of what CCI preaches is not novel. It is what we're seeing in other advanced economies, including the United States. And I think, regardless of who wins the White House with uh, USMCA Kuzma up for renegotiation, Canada does need to be smart and aggressive. Um, about ensuring that domestic industries are, are well supported, looking at things like IP digital rights. But, you know, we see other countries uh, with smart industrial policy. And, and what we are saying is that we should follow suit. One more question to you then. Um, you know, I'm thinking of, of other countries, sort of like the Scandinavian countries that are considered to be, you know, relatively high tax, high regulatory uh, high regulation jurisdictions, and they seem to be performing very, very well. They historically perform very well. Uh, is there are there any lessons uh, in your experience that we can learn from those Scandinavian countries and apply them here to help help uh, achieve the same kind of stellar results? Sure, uh, Benjamin, do you want to field that one? 
Yeah, for sure. So I think if you look at the Nordic countries, right, with uh, high productivity, uh, higher taxes, you know, really wonderful services that I think often, you know, we reference, you know, here in Canada, it really is how they're supporting their domestic uh, innovation uh, economy, right? So if you look at um, a country like Denmark, right, Nova is the company behind Ozempic, which, you know, folks might be familiar with given its, you know, popularity right now around the world. But Nova is really supported by the the Danish uh, government, right? So they marshal their education, they marshal a research and development really in that space. And and as an open small economy, that's where they've really decided to be players. And Nova is such a large company in Denmark that they actually calculated with and without the GDP of the company involved in it because it shifts the overall wealth and prosperity of the country so far. So as we march forward, looking at where there's opportunities for Canada to be winners in certain sectors, we really marshal our forces on, you know, capital, talent, customers, uh, and freedom to operate um, will really lead to, I think, some of the similar outcomes that we're seeing mm -hmm. in other sm uh, small open economies that are smart. And I, I think